J.J. Newberry's was an American five-and-dime store chain in the 20th century. It was founded in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania in 1911 by John Josiah Newberry. The company was a family business. J.J. Newberry was joined in management by his brothers C.T. Newberry and Edgar A. Newberry in 1919, at which time there were 17 stores with yearly sales of over $500,000. Over the years, the Newberry chain acquired other stores from all over the country, and at the time of founder J.J. Newberry's death in 1954, the chain had 475 stores. By 1961, the company operated 565 stores with a total yearly sales of $291 million. The Newberry chain was ultimately purchased by McCrory stores and then folded slowly as McCrory downsized and eventually entered bankruptcy and 300 stores closed in 1997, but some lingered on with at least one closing as late as 2001. After sitting empty for two years due to a devastating flood in 2011, locals Jim and Cornelia Mead decided the historic J.J. Newberry's department store needed new life. On February 14, 2013, Early Owego opened its doors to crowds of people, just like J.J. Newberry's did back in 1958. And they're still going pretty strong with over 90 dealers on two floors. And today, I get the honor of speaking with Jim Mead himself. A restaurant here in town. My dad was the chief of police, and they would. She had a jukebox in there. I don't, you know, I loaned some company, you know. I don't know whether the jukebox people had an ASCAP license, BMI, and all that or not, but they, they were always trying to get her to pay him 50 bucks or something, you know, go away. So <laughs> trying to shake her down? Well, I suppose it was legal, but I mean, you know, the, the lady didn't make $50 out of the jukebox, you know, so. Okay, so my name is Jessica Matthews. <laughs> my name is Jim Mead, and I'm the owner of the Early Owego Antique Center, and I understand that you may publish this on the web. And as long as it doesn't get changed or altered in some way to make me look like a fool, it's fine. <laughs> Not interested in that at all. <laughs> okay, and now, um, tell me, tell me about your life, about your, your history. <laughs> it, I mean, just your text that you sent me was intriguing. About, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about your family history. Well, I was I was born in, in uh, you know, I'm native of Tioga County, and so were my. My uh, grandparents uh, on my father's side, my mother's side, they, they came from Poland. Oh, wow. so they had a dairy farm uh, up on the hill. It was probably a farm that uh, the first wave of immigrants, the English or whomever, uh, had, had, had abandoned for a better soil in the river bottom, which happened a lot. Hmm. But they were able to raise seven children. And uh, about a hundred acre, twenty eight cow dairy farm. I spent a lot of time there when I was growing up. My father's parents were both born in Tioga County. My grandmother's parents were uh, born in Germany. But my grandpa, my grandfather, me, his parents were born, I'm sure, in uh, Tioga County. And, uh, and then prior to that, probably Connecticut and so forth, a lot of people have settled in this area. How far back uh, do you think your family history is in Tioga County? Well, I know it's at least till 1830. My great-great-grandfather was born in 1830. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was born here. So a pretty rich history of your family being here. <laughs> at, at least that branch, yeah, the Mead branch, yeah. And you said that some of your family was involved in local history? Oh yeah, of course. Being you know, being that going back that far, uh, you get involved. Like uh, my dad was chief of police here in Owego for nearly 25 years, and there's a lot of history with that, of course. And my grandfather was uh, kind of a jack of all trades. And I'm sure uh, just a not even maybe an eighth grade education in a one room schoolhouse up on Anderson Hill in the town of Cantor. Uh, his, his uh, mother and father uh, were in the same situation. They were, uh, you know, uh, 
farmers and traders and a lot of horse, a lot of horse dealing in my horse dealing. In huh? in my, in my, yeah, buying and selling horses, pigs. I used to listen to a lot of stories that my grandfather would tell about. He could remember, you know, traded their own horse for three pigs and a and a chicken and, and that kind of thing. And they used to do really before with money too much, right? Yeah, well, they did that. They did, yeah, they bartered with apes. And, and they, he was a great hunter, and his brother also, and they they would hunt uh, uh, fox and skunk and, uh, 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 well, I don't know if there were mink, but there was ferret and fisher, and those those pelts were worth something uh, when you had very little uh, cash money. And, uh, they uh, they were great they were great hunters with shotguns up on Anderson Hill and, and other other areas and uh, brought in some money that way. There's a story my grandfather told me. He was born in 1892. His name was Holtz Shaw Mead, and his father uh, was Nathan Mead. And at one time Nathan Mead worked for a man whose name was Holtz Shaw, and I found that gentleman and records here in Tagaw County and he was a prosperous farmer and my great-grandfather was you know worked for him as a laborer as I asked my grandfather once I said how did you get this rather unique name and he told he told me he said well my father named me after this man he was working for thinking maybe he'd get a five dollar gold piece or something he said but I don't think he got a thing oh goodness <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so there's a story. <laughs> and you said that your great great grandfather was a stable person for oh, Rockefeller? No, he, he was John so when my when John when uh, Nelson Rockefeller was governor, he would come to a we go to uh, campaign. And my dad being the chief of police would escort well he was in the village, uh, he had escorted him around the village when he was out in the county and the sheriff would be with him. Of course, there's all you know the state police too, but the local the local police always got involved. And um, so they they kind of struck up a friendship. And 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 Nelson Rockefeller was very interested in uh, in uh, his great uh, would be great grandfather John D. Rockefeller, who was born in the town of Richford, in Tuscarora, uh, just north of here, 20 miles on, on Michigan Hill. And uh, and in fact. In the 1970s, Nelson Rockefeller began to amass real estate in the town of Richford, uh, encompassing the farm where John D. was born and the surrounding area, like as much as 300 acres maybe. Goodness, that's a lot of land. And he had a notion that he wanted to create a memorial to, uh, to, to John D. Rockefeller there in the town of Richford. And my dad was in, my dad was always interested in local history too, and so uh, they, they would talk about that. And they knew a lot of the, he was, my dad was amazed that, that you know, the governor knew uh, a lot of these same stories about horse trading and so forth that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, and if you're interested in, in, uh, in Rockefeller, you know, that uh, John D. Rockefeller has a, uh, an interesting history in that his father was uh, kind of a shady, you know, one would say maybe a shady kind of guy, and his mother was uh, very, very pious. And so that's maybe how John D. becomes a very shrewd businessman from his father's influence and a very, and a very uh, philanthropic uh, from his mother's influence. So, uh, so they would talk about these uh, these horse uh, horse trading deals and uh, some of the horses. Uh, I, I, I guess one would probably have to say were of uh, curious uh, ownership by the time they, they got down here. The, William Big Bill Rockefeller was involved with the Loomis Gang, and it was Jim Mead's great-great-grandfather, Amzie Mead, that was involved with fencing these Loomis Rockefeller ill-gotten horses. He was also involved with the Loomis Gang in, in Madison County, and, uh, and of course he had a place in Moravia, and then he you know, had ties here in Richford, so he got from Utica to Moravia to Richford to the town of Candor, Anderson Hill, my great-great-grandfather, and then they tried to he would try to trade the horses off into Pennsylvania, and if you could get them across the, the state line, they cooled off a little bit. My goodness, that's, that's something. Yeah, well, that's, uh, it, it, you know, it all happened. And you can find these things alluded to. The, be the best, the best story, the best really true source, I think, probably on, uh, on uh, John D. Rockefeller and his early, and, uh, and his father, Big Bill Rockefeller, uh, is uh, 
autobiography, Titan, by uh, Chernoff, I think it's called. And the first uh, three or four chapters are, are pretty accurate. I mean, I, I've read them, and they're, 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 they're pretty accurate as to what was going on. There was a scurrilous book written, which is, uh, and the Rockefellers, it's purported that the Rockefellers tried to buy up all the copies and so forth. It was a, in, this is in the 20s, uh, that, um, uh, you know, try, it, it, it was kind of like a parody of, of Big Bill and some of his exploits. Goodness. And uh, they uh, they called him Rockwell or something. They didn't use the Rockefeller name. But uh, anyway, it's uh, uh, that's probably not as, as accurate as, uh, you know, as uh, certainly as Chernoff. But it, it's interesting that, uh, that these stories were compiled even you know even back then. And the the the, the building. <coughs> Well, the house that was on the, the what had been the Rockefeller place in Richmond was bought by a woman uh, and dismantled, and she was going to erect it in Coney Island. This was in the 20s or 30s, and get a, a nickel to go through it. And the Rockefeller family found out about that, and they, and they somehow put a stop to it, and it, and it made it to Binghamton. And it was put in storage. I guess they bought her out or something. A building was put in storage. Yeah, they took it apart and it was put in storage. And then when the governor was going to create this uh, memorial in the town of Richmond, uh, he had a, a, a confidant, Mr. Camp, who, uh, who lived here in the town of Berkshire, who had been married into the Patch family, a, a famous and prosperous family from northern Tiger County. And Mr. Camp was the governor's man for this project. And, and I remember in the newspaper seeing back then that they had acquired these uh, remains in this house. And uh, whatever happened to it, I don't know, because uh, uh, the brothers didn't care to go on with the project. And now there's just a little sign over there. And you walk into a little path, and there's a little sign that says here. But even they knew that that house isn't actually where John D. was born. Uh, John D. was born in, in, a, in, a, in a building that became ultimately on that farm a chicken coop. Because you're going way back to, you know. Yeah. So, uh, um, uh, interesting. And John D. Rockefeller came to Tioga County a lot, especially when he was older. Uh, he lived to be a very old man. My, my grandfather had a dime. You know, he would go around and give dimes out. My grandfather had a dime that he had been, been given by, by, by Rockefeller in one of his visits here. And, uh, it's, curi it's, it's, yeah, it's curious, though, that there's no Rockefeller library or anything. He never really, you know, as much as he, he, went, to, he went to school here, to, uh, what we call high school, the Wego Academy. The building still exists here on, on Court Street. And it is said that uh, one of his prized possessions, uh, and I was, uh, my father-in-law worked for, for David Rockefeller, and I was going to get a hold of the Rockefeller archives and ask him about this, but it was said that uh, one of John D. Rockefeller's prized possessions was a set of cabinet photos of everyone in his class at the Uigo Academy, except himself, because of course his mother didn't have money enough to, to participate. So it was just like, you know, your school photos now, you know. Yeah. So the, I'm sure that, that that collection still exists uh, in the Rockefeller archives. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, he came back and had, fond, I think, relatively fond memories of uh, growing up here. Is there anything else you'd like to share about history of, like, Oigo, or...? Well, you know, there's a lot of... I, I know there's a very rich of history. For, yeah, well, for anyone that's serious about it, there's nothing really wrong with a book called Early Oigo, which is kind of what our store is named after, in a way. There's two reasons we, we, you know, we chose this name. One is to pay homage to that book, which was uh, written by uh, one of the newspaper editors in town in the, in the 19th century, and it, it's a it's a it's a good it's a good reference. It has been reprinted by the Tioga County Historical Society with an index, which the original didn't have, and that that's helpful. It's at least an index of, uh, of names, of people, not, not not a complete index, but if you're interested in a particular person, you know, it's mentioned, and uh, that's a good reference. Uh, yeah, from the, from you know, a hundred years ago, uh, or more now, 150 yeah, years ago. But uh, uh, and then there have been some because of centennials and bicentennial and so forth. There's been some things written, and those are sort of okay, mostly okay. But you kind of have to watch the, you know, the thing, things that are captions to photos and things. And, 
creep in, but uh, uh, county historians uh, have done have done uh, you know, monographs on different things, which are very good. And so there's a there's a there's a if you're interested, uh, the County Historical Society and uh, Tom McIntyre uh, has published through them on, on various things of bridges and, and uh, Emma Cedar in the county has done Hiawatha Island and. And you can you can glean quite a bit of what it was like if you take the take the effort to you know to read and, and, and observe. I, mean, um, I did a lot of googling, but I don't have I didn't have any paper books to research on. Mm -hmm. Well, you should invest in something. Uh, Sounds like there's a they have a rich history here. Yeah, yeah. You can sometimes you can see things and if you see it, you don't, don't really know what you're looking at. One of my uh, I like old mechanical. And uh, there were two, there were two uh, electrical generating stations on the Owego Creek. Uh, the first one, the earlier one, was uh, just north of Talkett Street, and uh, had three machines in it. That was called the Owego uh, Light and Power Company. And then the subsequent, uh, more modern uh, uh, facility was uh, near the fairgrounds. And that building still exists. Is and that still, where is that, that, that okay. NYSEG building was originally a, a hydroelectric plant. Oh, that's pretty cool. And the uh, the old raceway is actually still there that came down on the uh, east side of, uh, of the Oigo Creek. And uh, now there's a power line that runs down yeah. it. But at one time that was full of water and went down to uh, power the turbines uh, at that hydro station. That's curious. Of course, now they talk about going back to things, you know, renewable <laughs> energy and so forth, but we had it back then. Yeah. But that's a very historic, that, that confluence of the Owego Creek and and, uh, and the Susquehanna River is a you know, an old, old history. They say that the original Indian village here was just on the west side of the Owego Creek uh, in that area, in the area of what's now called Vesper Cliffs, the uh, large home that's built there. It was built by one of the first lumber magnates, and he, uh, he, uh, this was all, of course, we're, other than in the, I guess, the delta or alluvial plain of, of the intersection of the, of the Owego Creek and Susquehanna River would flood every year, you know, so the, there weren't really trees there, but it made an excellent place for growing you know, corn and squash and beans, which is, is what the, the native culture did, and uh, all that area, which is now the fairgrounds and the, and the Price drop of plaza and so forth that would that would flood every year and, uh, uh, and provided a you know perfect situation for for natives for, for farming you know and uh, but then when the when the white man did come after the after the revolution the, the Sullivan Clinton campaign a lot of the soldiers they saw they saw that and said well there's good land here you know so they developed the interior this was the, the, the frontier the colonial frontier in, in 17 you know 90. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, they built the, this one gentleman built the sawmill and just sawed a lot of lumber and built built a home and and, uh, and then it, you know there's all the business about Owego's geographical position made it uh, really important uh, to the extent even that we had the you know the second railroad in New York State that connected Owego and Ithaca and there were no other railroads hundreds of miles around, just, just that one, originally horse-drawn. And it was to, you know, the, the Erie Canal uh, touched the north end of Cuba Lake. So you could get goods and products from Syracuse and Rochester and so forth down to Ithaca. And then they had an inclined plane uh, that would bring railroad cars up and down the hill out of Ithaca to the, the terminus on, the, on top of the hill for, for the uh, Ithaca and Oigo, and then they would trundle down through Wilsonville and Gridleyville and Cander and Catatonk to, to uh, Owego and uh, the tracks, wooden tracks with strap rail on top came down on the, came through the, uh, the west side of the courthouse square and then made a right hand or left hand turn alongside the river and they would, they would load the uh, uh, products, mostly uh, Green and plaster and things from mills, you know, milling was important. Uh, things like plaster, and uh, there was a, they made plaster in Ithaca. There was limestone there, so they could make, they would make, they would grind that and make plaster. Well, that stuff all ended up on art, what they called art, uh, 
was a, like a raft. Or, and uh, in the, especially in the spring of the year in the freshet, they would load those things on, and then you could get on the, on the river, you could get to, you know, wherever you want, you know, Wilkes, uh, Wilkes Bear or, 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 uh, or Harrisburg or anywhere in between, or ultimately uh, Baltimore, you know, the Chesapeake. So you, you could, wherever you could get the most for your lumber or plaster or whatever it is, that, that, you know, that, very important, uh, you know, transportation hub. That's the other reason that we, that we named our store Early Oswego is because I, I keep looking for the earliest map I can find that shows Oswego, and there's a various various spellings of the name. The earliest one that, that we have so far is uh, 1757, and uh, and there's nothing else around here but Oswego on, on the map, you know. So. So it was a it was a known and important place, uh, you know, way early on. Yeah, yeah when, when it really was wilderness. Yeah, that was kind of fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to, to see nothing. You know, and Front Street was a was a dirt dirt street. And lake lakes there was it was called Lake Street because there was a mud puddle out here where the where the uh, where the store is. And, uh, there was other uh, pockets of water uh, up along the Fury Railroad there's a there's a depression where there was there was water and, because again it was this it was a delta floodplain yeah, flood plain, yeah. Um, I read that there was also a fire that there was a fire down, like the business district yeah in the what 1850s or 60s I, yeah I think the exact yeah <laughs> yeah there was a large fire and that's why we have so many brick commercial brick buildings are all of a certain age because they replaced the wooden buildings with brick buildings all in probably the, you know, about the same decade or something. Yeah. Five years or something. Rebuilding. Well, it makes the town look beautiful with all the brick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very nice. And of course, I've lived long enough now to see our store here become a, when they first did the federal historic district designation business, this store was considered kind of an outlier because it was a modern 1956 building in the, in the otherwise you know, Victorian yeah. Oviedo. But now, if you were to do the survey and answer all the questions, it, it has somewhat of a cachet of its own as a, as a mid-century building. You know? mm -hmm. So it's gone to kind of gone from the ugly duckling to uh, uh, something of note of its own self. We're so happy that it's not vacant that we were able to come up with a use for it. No, it's and it's, it is very bright and beautiful out yeah. there. When it was vacant, it was very, very real negative on the town. Yeah. It's quite a large, like, building, too, for it to just be such vacant. Well, that's it. It was really uh, yeah, hard to a, fill a large uh, space. 10,000 square feet on each floor. It's oh, basically wow. a 100 foot square. And, uh, I don't know how many that's about, about, I think they demolished six buildings to build it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but it was quite the thing when they, uh, you know, when it was open in the, in the, in the late 50s, it was, uh, it was a sensation to have a... J.J. Newberry's? Mm -hmm. I read it was sort of like a Woolworth's, like a five and dime yeah. store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it was... I don't think the chain was as old as Woolworths, but uh, so I think it was a little more upscale than that. Well, Woolworths, they called it Five and Dime, but that, that name went all the way back, you know. But they, they, they grew up into being a real department store as well. But this was more of a, well, I don't know. If you remember James Way, it was probably like a James Way, but on three floors instead of one. Or, or a Kmart instead, on three floors instead of one. And it had the soda fountain. And, a hot dog or sandwich, so much so stuff in for food. Yeah, and a bakery and, and, and pets and toys and but housewares and, and uh, clothing and jewelry and curtains and, and fabric and notions and window shades, paint, hardware, tools. <laughs> yeah, I, Sounds I, like I, the place I, can, to I be. can go around and show you where all the departments used to be. <laughs> <coughs> That must have been something to see, though. Yeah, well, it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a, a lopus, you know. I mean, it was a, it was a place where people congregated. And, and, you know, going to Newberry's was a, <laughs> you know, Halloween, especially Christmas, to see the toys. Then, we, of course, we had the hard, we had a, we had a, a legitimate hardware store, the Weagle Murray Company, and 
they had the agency for the Lionel trains, and, and so they had a big train set going in there at Christmas time. And they had toys as well. And uh, Farnham's had toys. And, uh, there was a lot of independent uh, retail of, of all sorts of things. You know, radio store, radio and television, all these things now that are just don't exist as single proprietorships anymore. Now. Things change, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I love the place. I love like the little. I love multi vendor antique places. I think that they always have the most interesting collections. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, we, and we have we have great vendors. I mean, we have people with, a, with an eclectic thing. I mean, it's eclectic because the vendors are, are not. They don't all handle the same type of merchandise. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, we, and we, we really try not to have, you know, yard sale kind of thing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, it, it, yeah we're, we're very happy with our, with our cadre of vendors. Yeah. It's a nice place. Thank you. And thank you for your time. I, I promised to meet my friend at the museum at one, and it's one now. So okay, good. Gonna have when is the opening of that, of that exhibit? It's today, or it should be today. Is it at a particular time or not? Um, I'm sure they're open, but I know they close at, one, at four. Oh, okay. So. I know I took some items over in the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. So if you, you see some things that are labeled uh, on loan from the Tioga Transportation Museum, that's my collection. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to get a, a video, a, a little shot of our, our 1908 Cadillac. I, I drove that down today because uh, we're going on a <laughs> tour tomorrow and I wanted to make uh, sure it was running. I, I would love to get a shot of How klutzy I can be. I'm not going to walk through this, but. It's just a disaster waiting for happen with me, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. What would you do with it? Sit down here once you got it spinning. This drips water onto it, and then you bring the knife blade or whatever back and forth across in order to grind it down. Okay, but this one, this one is gorgeous. Look at the face of this. The top sign is I totally can tell Alice. Experience that I love antique places like this with multi vendors. There's always amazing things to look at, and I can spend hours in these stores and almost always come away with something that I'm bringing home with me. Thank you for watching today's episode of Traversing History. I hope you enjoyed, and if you really liked it, like, subscribe, leave comments if you have any suggestions for where I can go next or who I can meet next. And I hope you enjoyed your time with me today. See you next time.